Now carrying on our thinking about the signs and symptoms that we can see in anemia, we notice that anemia causes hypoxemia, a reduced amount of oxygen in the blood. And actually this is what anemia really is. Anemia is a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. And when the oxygen levels in the blood drop, that's going to be detected by chemoreceptors. And these are located in the large arteries, the aorta and the carotid bodies, just off the carotid artery. And what they do is they send messages to the brainstem, the medulla. The medulla oblongata, to the lower part of the brainstem, which contains the cardiac centre, the vasomotor centre and the um, respiratory centre. So when these chemoreceptors detect oxygen lack in the blood, the medulla oblongata is going to respond by increasing respiratory rate. Increasing respiratory rate and depth of ventilation. In other words, there's going to be what we call a, tach a tachypnea. The respiratory rate is going to increase even at rest and it will be particularly increased during observe, uh, exertion so there will be a short of breath on exertion. The patient will become more short of breath on exertion, S-O-B-E. And as well as that, the medulla oblongata when it detects oxygen lack is going to increase overall sympathetic. outflow. There's going to be an increase in sympathetic activity. Let's just carry on with the increase in respiratory rate first. Um, if there's an increase in the respiratory rate, that is a tachypnea, the patient is breathing faster and especially shorter breath on exertion, then the effect of that, because they're breathing faster, that's going to increase oxygen saturations. So the breathing faster will increase oxygen saturations. The blood as it goes through the lungs will be more saturated, optimizing saturations. But we've also mentioned there's a increased sympathetic outflow. <coughs> so the hypox, hypo, um, hypoxemia is going to increase sympathetic activity. Of the autonomic nervous system. Now, if you increase sympathetic outflow, if there's increased activity of the sympathetic nervous system, what's that going to do to the heart rate? And as you probably know, that's going to increase heart rate. And it's also going to increase stroke volume. The heart will beat more times per minute and more blood will be ejected per cardiac contraction. And this is going to give rise to um, clinical features. So one of the clinical features we have in anemia is, is a bounding pulse. The pulse is more bounding than usual. And it can also lead to palpitations. The patient becomes aware of their, their heart beating. So again, we can highlight the clinical features here. Uh, bounding pulse palpitations. <coughs> 
increased respiratory rate. These are things we actually see, or the patient reports, tachypnea, short of breath on exertion. Right. Now, <clears throat> the reason that the heart rate and the stroke volume increase, the reason for this is because together these two will increase cardiac output. They will increase cardiac output. So you can see now we've got improved oxygen saturations and we've got increased cardiac output. And both of these effects are going to increase what we call oxygen flux. It's going to be increased oxygen flux. Now to understand this, we do need a bit of background physiology. And that background physiology is described in, in this equation here. So we need to understand this equation. So oxygen flux, that's the amount of oxygen going from the lungs to the tissues. Flux means movement through. And that oxygen flux is determined by the cardiac output. Now the cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped out by the heart in a one minute period. And it's defined as heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. So the heart rate is the number of times the heart is contracting um, per minute, um, say 70 times per minute. And the stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected by the left ventricle per contraction, say 70 times. So you can see from that the cardiac output is going to be 70 times 7, which is 4,900 mils. So the cardiac output is the volume of blood ejected by the heart per minute. And I think you can probably see that if the cardiac output is higher, so suppose the cardiac output was normally 5 litres a minute, uh, litres a minute, but with compensations that rose up to 7 litres a minute, Can you see there, there's more blood going through the circulatory system. Therefore, even although there are fewer red blood cells, they're going around more quickly. So the, the delivery trucks or the delivery men are, are running around in circles faster. So that's going to improve the overall oxygen flux. So that's why if we increase cardiac output, that will increase oxygen flux because the blood is going around quicker, delivering the oxygen more quickly. But we notice that oxygen flux is cardiac output multiplied by oxygen saturations, uh, which is the next term in the equation, oxygen saturations. So the more saturated the blood, so the oxygen saturations describe the proportion of the haemoglobin that is saturated. And uh, the nearer 100% that is, obviously the more oxygen is going around to the uh, being circulated round. So increasing oxygen saturations will increase oxygen flux. Increasing cardiac output will increase oxygen flux. And we can see that's exactly what the body's done. It's so clever. It's increased respiratory rate to increase oxygen saturations, therefore increased improving oxygen flux. The oxygen lack has been detected by the peripheral chemoreceptors in the, uh, in the large arteries. That's gone to the medulla oblongata, uh, that, which has increased the respiratory rate, but of course it's also the medulla oblongata, uh, which increases the sympathetic outflow. So the medulla oblongata is also increasing the sympathetic outflow. It's kind of going around there like that, isn't it? 
So the medulla oblongata is increasing the sympathetic outflow. Uh, the increased sympathetic outflow from the cardiac centre in the medulla oblongata is increasing heart rate and stroke volume. We can detect that by a bounding pulse. The patient can feel the uh, increased stroke volume, can feel the increased heart rate, this, these unpleasant palpitations. But can you see their compensatory mechanisms because they're increasing cardiac output? If you increase cardiac output, you're increasing oxygen flux. So the, 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 this, the improved oxygen flux is, is to compensate for the hypoxemia. It's a compensatory, it's a compensatory device, which of course is good. We're compensating. The tissues are getting more oxygen. So the improved oxygen flux is going to reduce tissue hypoxia. So improved oxygen flux means less tissue hypoxia. The tissues are getting more life-giving oxygen. Um, but the increased heart rate and the increased stroke volume is going to increase the workload of the myocardium. So we get increased The heart's having to work harder. This compensatory tachycardia, the compensatory increased stroke volume, all going to make the heart work harder. Okay, for a short period of time, but this can go on for a long time, of course. Um, especially problematic if it's associated with other deficiencies, such as vitamin B deficiency. Um, but over time, <clears throat> This is going to increase, like if you go to the gym and work out, if you work, the muscles are working harder, the muscles are going to get bigger over time. So it's the same with the heart, we're going to get ventricular hypertrophy. And other damage to the myocardium. Now it's going to be enlarged. Um... On the chest x-ray, of course, you'll notice that as a, as a cardiomegaly. Long-term complication of anemia. Um, but over time, the ventricular hypertrophy, over time, it will no longer be able to compensate by just getting bigger. It will decompensate and will get heart failure. So we see that a long-term complication of anemia is heart failure. And of course, heart failure is also a cause of anemia. So once there is some heart failure caused by the anemia, we get into a vicious downward spiral of heart failure. Um, in heart failure, there can be a left ventricular failure. Left ventricular failure. And uh, that's going to lead to pulmonary edema. It's the LVF that leads to pulmonary edema. And that's going to lead to um, soggy lungs. And the clinical feature we might notice first. Is orthopnea. Shortness of breath when the patient is lying down particularly relieved somewhat when the patient's sitting up and um, <clears throat> the heart failure of course will affect the right ventricle as well right ventricular failure and the right ventricular failure is going to lead to increase in the uh, venous pressure in the systemic veins so this can lead to systemic edema. So you'll notice probably swollen ankles first. And also if you look for it, you'll notice there's an increase in a jugular venous 
pressure increase increase JVPs so we can notice the uh, systemic edema indicating the heart failure we can notice the increased jugular vena pressure increased jugular venous pressure indicating heart failure as indeed does the orthopnea as it just affects the different sides of the heart so the right ventricular failure systemic edema the left ventricular failure pulmonary edema there is a whole series of videos where we cover this in great detail um, not only in the Campbell teaching channel if you wanted to watch those um, so <clears throat> we see the clinical features um, shortness of breath lying down edema later features complications I really do hope you can treat your patients before we get to this stage it's appalling that such pathology should be caused by uh, most commonly simple iron deficiency in the world such a simple thing to treat uh, but you can notice before that a bounding pulse, patient complains of palpitations, patient breathing quickly, short of breath on exertion. But we notice that these are compensatory mechanisms to improve the oxygen flux. So we get more oxygen going to the tissues, which is exactly what we want. And that's explained by the fact that the oxygen flux is increased by improving cardiac output or raising cardiac output beyond normal, raising it beyond normal and maximizing oxygen saturation. Now we do notice that um, the oxygen flux is also dependent on haemoglobin concentrations, but usually the whole problem in anemia is that the haemoglobin is not enough. There's not enough haemoglobin. Um, but the oxygen lack will stimulate the kidneys to produce erythropoietin. But of course, if the bone marrow does not have enough iron or enough B12 or enough folic acid to make the red cells, then the haemoglobin, the increase in haemoglobin compensatory mechanism, unfortunately, is not going to be available to the individual. But if someone's got iron deficiency and you give them iron, then they'll be able to compensate. If they're short of B12 and you give them cytamine injections, then they'll be able to compensate. If they're short of folic acid and you give them folic acid and advise them how to get folic acid from the diet, then they'll be able to compensate. Then when the haemoglobin concentrations go back to normal, that means the patient will essentially no longer be anemic. So the tachypnea, the fast breathing rate, won't be necessary. The patient will no longer be short, short of breath on exertion. Because the blood's carrying plenty of oxygen, because there's plenty of haemoglobin to carry the oxygen, the oxygen flux will be adequate, so the cardiac compensation will no longer be necessary. So the tachycardia and the increased stroke volume, all designed to increase cardiac output, will no longer be necessary. And the complications, the long-term com complications associated with that, um, won't occur because of your interventions. Bit of a congested sheet of paper, but it still managed to fit just on one side. 